This is day nine of the August 95 10-day retreat in spring water. A cloudy, warm, humid morning. with our faithful accompaniment of bugs singing or courting each other. Who knows? Are we here? Expecting a talk. That's what's happening here. Expecting a talk. What's going to come out? So much happens from one day to the next as far as meetings is concerned, problems brought up. Things discussed and looked at agreed with or disagreed with, shared, searching, or despair, or joy, happiness or pain, it's all happening here, in one or another, today or tomorrow. In the next moment, or the next day, we're no longer the same that we were. Tomorrow we will not be the same as we're right now. The moods and feelings and physical body have changed and will have changed and are changing all the time. And even though it seems that to be that same hum of cicadas and crickets, insects, it isn't. It's not the same breath. Not the same heartbeat. It's always new, always new, always different. Even the same thought as yesterday or yesteryear or for all my life, the same th seemingly same thought is a new thought this moment. If seen freshly. Questions have come up like, isn't thought really necessary? Can thought ever end? Do we need memory? Isn't there all something beautiful about memory? Remembering the good times we had together? Or remembering how a sentence was started so it can be brought to some kind of an understandable end? Sometimes that memory is lacking, so something hangs in there. When you see a transcription, you shudder. <laughs> and yet, amazingly enough, memory does work to some extent, even in a talk like this. And bringing in examples from early childhood, past experiences. So why this question of whether memory is good or bad, right or wrong, whether it should be or shouldn't be, whether thought should be there or has a function. Why not just observe it? And then the difficulty 
comes with, Tony says, I should observe it. It is so insidious, so sneaky secret, these categories or ways of listening. The, the mode, how, can, how clearly can it be put? I would like to use the cl most clear words, and yet it's impossible to be always understood or never to, mis to be misunderstood, because if there isn't understanding, there is inevitably misunderstanding. It's as simple as that. So in talking about thought and more talking about the problematical side of thought, how it creates images about my enemies, superiority and inferiority, The need to conquer evil, evil people, because thought can do that. Thought can paint pictures of evil people, even though the people may be just like you and me, but living somewhere else, a little bit remote, or right amongst us, but identifiable by certain skin color or <clears throat> facial features or a hair form identifiable as dark-haired or blonde, blue-eyed, crooked nose or straight nose. So, since it needs abstractions, though, because children, before they're becoming indoctrinated with prejudice, don't seem to mind. Or do we, as children, mind? how people look like, where have we learned it? There seems to be an attraction toward pretty children, nice looking ones. And yet people get together into real friendships as children and don't care how they look because something else is shared and, and experienced together. So it needs abstraction, talking about it, visualizing it, image making, and reaction to these images to point out groups of people who are undesirable, not worth living among us, only worth to be conquered or annihilated. This is the activity of thought we're talking about, just to exemplify how crucial it is to be aware of what thought is doing. Not just as a pastime or an abstract intellectual amusement. It's vital for our relationship with each other to see how we're imaging each other and how we react not to the person here or there, but to images of this person, which seem to, most of the time, override the actuality, affect the perception, so that we don't seem to be able to perceive somebody except through what we think and picture he is. And that's not what he or she or I am, is or I am. What are we? We just said it. We can't be grasped, changing all the time not images which are solid, fixed, and affecting our perception of each other. So that is one thing that thought does. It doesn't, by pointing this out, giving examples and being open, open to other examples, which are of necessity, left out, we can't say everything, this doesn't mean that thought is bad or only creates images which are obstructive. To, to find out the full functioning of thought needs our interest in it and our awareness, which is not ours, 
awareness, realizing what is going on from moment to moment, at times, not all the time. Some, someone calling up when I'm home saying they're going to be in town, could they come over? They say, of course, come for a meal. And thought gets going to prepare that meal before the first step is done to the store or into the kitchen. Figuring it all out, figuring out what time it would be good to have it ready so when they come we don't have to be cooking and can we talk a little bit. This is thought operating to prepare something. A trip, a building, a meal, a retreat, a book, a family. It's, it's open to discovery, open to inspection, and it, awareness is not such a rare commodity, it is there. We are aware, only get so involved with what it is that is seen and heard, what we don't like, we hate, or we love, we want to keep forever. And with that, the emotions getting involved, that there's little attention to the whole process moving unfolding as a process. So let, on this last day, because tomorrow we will do, do readings, on this last day of talking like this, let me say again, never is there the intention to say you shouldn't do this, but you should do that. This is good and this is bad. This is what I want you to really do. Make an effort to get there. This is how we hear it, though. It's the amazing thing that a programmed, conditioned brain hears things which are not being said, just projects it right onto it. And with that come so much, comes so much conflict because we are so conditioned to push ourselves, to strive, to get, to become, to achieve and attain, and realizing our inability to do all of that. We may attain some and achieve a little bit, but there's always more that we feel we should get, because the program keeps running if it isn't lit up time and time again with some awareness which is not subject to coercion. It doesn't need to be coerced because it's there. Most of the time maybe unbeknownst, although little firefly blinks are there every day. The light is put out so quickly because being aware of greed, judgment of greed comes in. I shouldn't be greedy. That's not according to the precepts. Or what's wrong with being greedy? The others are greedy too. Rationalization, justification, all of this movement of thought which brings me to something that started out a discussion yesterday night, evening, which maybe fits into this. Someone saying, I've just read a book, I am reading a book, I have been reading it during retreat, very fascinated by it. And the author talks about the movement of thought and watching the movement of thought. And try as I may, I can't watch the movement of thought. I get a headache. <laughs> Trying to move that, move, watch that movement of thought. 
trying to move that watching of the movement of the heart. And then bringing it to discussion and the discussion evolving. Does thought move? Doesn't it move? famous koan, probably everybody knows, just comes to mind, the two monks arguing, does the flag move because of the wind? How does it go? <laughs> <laughs> that, okay, you took the punch. <laughs> it's okay, no, no, you don't have to be sorry. It's your punchline too. Does it make something clear? flag moving, what is it that is moving? Yet we could give a thousand reasons, endless reasons for that flag moving, and then some more. And this wise guy walking by who is being asked says, it's your, it's your minds, venerable sirs, that is moving. Now, somebody brought up yesterday, thought doesn't move. When I watch a thought, it goes away, or else, it's stuck, doesn't move, and concentrates on that thought, and at least for a while, it doesn't last forever, at least for a while it doesn't move, or else watching this thought, it's like being zapped, because now there's a moment of attention. So then comes the commentary, well, what's this business of thought moving, or the movement of thought? Thought either is there or it isn't there, which is a good enough statement. And yet, what is going on in these ever-moving minds? Not ever-moving, but most of the time, moving minds. But thought and image and prejudice and wanting and fearing. From the past to the future and back to the past and into the present, one enormous movement, a shared movement, a collective movement of, we could broaden it out, of human consciousness, observable here in this manifestation in one individual body. The movement of wanting, the movement of wanting to see thought as a movement. Do you see that? Wanting as a movement, meaning from stating, I can't watch it, to, but I would like to watch it, which needs the idea of watching it and some value attached to that. It would be good because this author, whom I respect greatly, seems to imply this is what we should be doing. And this would be good to be done. It's a movement, isn't it? From here, the idea of my not being able to do it or not doing it, the movement of the thought, I should be doing it because others seem to be doing it. Why can't I do it? But I can't do it and a headache. I don't know whether it was cleared up very well last night, but isn't underlying the headache, this conflict, with what I think I should be doing and what I feel incapable of doing and yet ought to be doing, yet can't do, but should be doing. It's back and forth movement. And the brain responds. Because it is manifesting all of that. So how open can the question be asked without it becoming a compulsion in the mind of the listener?
how open can anything be said without becoming a rule, a commandment? A threat in the mind of the listener. Is it so radical to talk and look and dialogue with each other and really truly not judging even though the intensity of voice may already evoke that association of a judge or someone who demands something or expects something or wants something to happen. You see how handicapped we all are in talking and listening. Freely. Somebody said, if I remember it right, in this retreat I hear a subtle change of just, just being aware of the shoulds and oughts. Don't quite remember how it was put. But the absence of any demand or command. Maybe there are changes going on in all of us, not just in, in talking ever gentler, and this is how it was qualified or uh, described, it is very gentle. Maybe all of us are getting a bit gentler at times with ourselves and each other so that we can communicate with each other in an amazingly new way. A way which illuminates the judgments that lurk there all the time in this conditioned body-mind. Judgment and compulsion, guilt, Ambition, com conditioned into this and lurking there. To affect the perception, to affect the hearing or the talking. So can that come into awareness? And in saying that, I'm not saying it has to come into awareness. Or it must, or you should. It's a simple question asked of all of us. And it need not link up with associations of the past when they are when they are seen. Oh, there's another shirt. Oh, I was judging this. Doesn't need to be verbalized. Some people say it's helpful. The words come out. But at that moment, there's already a change of mode from should to listening to attention, which brings the should into light. The should may override the light. And maybe some at the moment, unstoppable compulsion to go on with what one feels one should do. That happens. And again, as awareness dawns, as it has a way of doing, we know not why, that can come into light again. The compulsion of 
going on with it. And at a moment of attention, maybe wondering, why is that? Not searching for intellectual reasons, but watching some more because an interest is fanned. So there's no need to blame ourselves or each other or our parents or society for all this installation or instilling of shoulds and oughts which cram and crowd the perception of what's really being said and happening. Because that too is, is happening. It's been happening for ages. And millennia, this is how we bring up our children. Because this is how we were brought up. And the program keeps running. Until maybe all of a sudden one wonders, why did I say that? It's just like my mother. And I didn't like it when she said that. And here I'm just repeating it. For the first time I said to our son, because I was exasperated, I didn't know how to control him. Oh, I don't even remember the incident that happened, but I remember hearing myself say, I'm never going to forget that. And it struck me deeply because this is what was about the most threatening thing that my mother could say to me or to us children. I'm never going to forget that. Oh my God, she's never going to forget it. Never going to be forgiven. Never going to run freely without that guilt. And maybe because it was so powerful, it was stored as memory and popped out in a moment of exasperation. But it was seen, it was heard. Maybe I had said it lots of times before and didn't hear, but this time it was heard. And never said it again. Because the whole connection and pain of it was so clear. Which doesn't mean Every time something is seen clearly, it should not pop up again. If it pops up, either it's seen or it isn't seen. Before, during, or after. Sometimes this awareness which shines light on whatever happens inside, outside, is called our birthright, our true nature. Or the unborn and unconditioned. unconditionable. But because the mind is so habituated to, to assess the value of cricket hum, or heartbeat, breathing, well, it's all right, but it's not enough. Therefore, it seems to be shaded out, this birthright of bright awareness. Because of the foggier, somewhat darker preoccupation with what we see through the conditioned judgments and associated, I like it, I hate it, 
what it reminds me of that's pleasurable or painful, and on and on and on, circuiting around the brain. And then, for no special reason, there's an awareness of all this circuiting, spinning around, looping around in the brain and body. And can it be bare of all judgment? It usually isn't, because we don't want to be looping around, particularly not on day six or nine, of a retreat. There's a self-image. By now I should be like maybe these other people are who seem to sit so solidly. Someone mentioned this morning that over the years his practice has been the question, who am I? And that question seems to crop up with different teachers. Sometimes wondering, maybe if I went to that teacher, maybe I would really get it. And that the person continued in wondering and, and looking inwardly, as it were. <clears throat> it's at times quite clear that the self is thought, thinking about myself, gives a deep sense of self, because the thinking about myself is not just thought process, which we tend to think is something other than the body, but it is physical, material process, and is intimately, inseparably connected with all the physical functions of the organs, glands, muscles that comprise this organism. So thinking about myself is also feeling happiness, pleasure, pain, fear, anger, energy or drainedness, freshness or tiredness. So then the person continued something like this. Or where does the thought about the self come from, because it's quite clear that self is created by thinking. But where does the thinking come from? He proceeded to ask, and then answer, well, it comes from the self. I said, I find myself in this loop. Can't get out of it. The self comes from thinking, and thinking comes from the self. Ah, we can stretch the loop a little bit. Thinking about our house on Moose Hill Road comes from memory of that house. If I didn't know that house, or for some reason the memory was obliterated, I wouldn't think, or there wouldn't be thought about that house. And everybody don't have to think about Musa, because that thought doesn't come, does it, unless you've been to Musa. But where you live, there's a memory of that, different aspects, the front door, the backyard, basement, or if it's just a room, the climate, the weather, all of the memory is ready to respond with what we call thoughts and images. And for simplicity's sake, thoughts, images, judgments, emotions, it can all be 
lumped together in one movement of consciousness with its memories. So without memory, would there be thought? Well, you could say sometimes there are thoughts in my mind. I'm sure I have not experienced anything of the kind. And there are answers for this, whether they're true or not, I don't know. That there are memory fields, storages of memory, not just inside this body, but floating around without spatial distance. And as respectable scientists who investigate that, how come certain things are learned faster once they have been learned? even though there's no contact between the faster learners and the initially slower learners. How come kids learn computers as though it was their daily bread and us oldsters? <laughs> Don't we have access to that memory field? Well, one learns it a little bit. So, now, we don't stop at, at, at satisfaction with memory. Where does memory come from? Where, where does consciousness come from? Oh, if you don't want to go into the general, where do I ultimately come from? Okay, I come from egg and sperm of my mother, and they come from egg and sperm of their mothers and fathers. But how far back can we take it? all the way to the Big Bang, and where did that come from? Well, scientists are working on it, we hear. They'll come up with an answer. Until that happens, and if it happens, it will not be the ultimate answer, because new questions can always be posed, and new tools be invented, instruments. And an enormous relief to say, I don't know. And not just as a way out from under the burden of having to know who I am. The practice, the failure, or the success, the burden of it all. Not just as a way out of that, but as a statement of fact. I don't know what I am, or where I come from. Because in listening quietly, in this not knowing state of being, there's a realization that to ask where did I come from and to think where did I come from involves thinking with its limitations, which will never end because thought itself is limited, fragmented. So, it's easier and easier to say, I don't know what I am, where I come from. Of course, I have my identity card, which says F on there for female. Age, a picture which doesn't look like me anymore. As I look in the mirror today, those are things that are practical and needed. Writing on some application what one is doing. <clears throat> but for being here and wondering about the meaning of life and death, the origin of it all. I start with not knowing. Not slipping into a fragmented movement of thinking it out. Because that movement can be seen 
to be limited. Not knowing, truly not knowing what I am. Identity is seen for what it is, but that's not what I am. A passport picture. A gender designation. Not knowing what we are is not a shutdown. It's anything but a shutdown. It's an, an opening up to what's there, happening this moment without needing to be identified. Identification mechanism may jump into action, but it's seen jumping into action. It's not needed. It's not appropriate, right? I don't want to identify anything, just not know what's there and just be all of that. It's not a desire to be that, it's a fact, we are all of that. All of what's happening in immense, limitless space, which you could say, well, why, drop, why not drop the word space and time? Because they need thinking and imagining. But being fully here needs no thinking, no imagining. It's happening. It's there for all of us right now. A vast openness that need not know what it is, what I am, what you are, and therefore a. Don't even call it relationship anymore. There's no relationship. We're all here. So are the clouds and all the water and air and bird song, humming, buzzing, beating, breathing. Is thought jumping around, trying to grasp, trying to explain, trying to think? See it. Like so many grasshoppers. Thought cannot be here quietly, openly. It can be quiet, but it cannot see can only think. And thinking about one's personality is the limitation. Identified with one's body, mind, and personality is the limitation. At times we may enjoy this limitation, a lot of times we suffer from it. But that's not all of life. It's just life sort of caught in a bubble the bubble of my temporary life. Everything that's happening is happening on that surface of the bubble, all the colors. But inside it's empty. When it bursts, the surface is gone. The emptiness is untouchable. By untouchable, I don't mean intransigent or remote. is here, everywhere.
emptiness, not a concept, not meaning the void. What can you say? Unformed energy, life energy, awareness are these words. Informing the wanting, the fearing, the despair, the joy. And also defolding into just simple being, listening, not knowing. We will end here for today.